Hello and welcome to the latest Revision video this week looking at life in Nazi Germany. This one will be in two halves because you have to look at it from two sides. In this unit we need to think about the positives and the negatives of living in Nazi Germany. Often students can talk at great length about the negatives. They can talk about the Holocaust, they can talk about concentration camps, they can talk about the SS, and all of those things are valid, good points. But what they often miss are all the positives. What reasons did nice, ordinary, decent people have to support the Nazi party? The Nazis understood that. They knew you can't make people do things just through fear, just through force, just through terror. They won't do it. Fear leads to anger. And if they're angry, at some point they'll fight back. So they were very careful to make sure they gave people lots and lots of good reasons to support the Nazis. So in the first half of this two-part extravaganza, we'll look at the positives. Because the Nazis controlled the media, because Goebbels was Minister of Propaganda, they could orchestrate what people saw and heard in Germany. They were very clever at putting on big, extravagant events. The most important were the Nuremberg rallies. Joseph Goebbels organised these in the summer of every year. They combined political speeches with camps, bands, marches, flying displays and most of all an opportunity to see Hitler in action. They were a celebration of Nazi and German pride and achievement. They brought colour and excitement into people's lives and gave everyone a real sense of belonging to a great movement and a great community. They were very carefully planned organised, they were choreographed to show off the discipline and the unity of the Nazi party. The Nazis filmed the rallies to show in cinemas because not everybody could get to them. So they wanted to convince everyone else in Germany that everyone supported the Nazi parties. The best example of this is, is Lenny Riefenstahl's staggering film called Triumph of the Will. I'll put a link on Edmodo to it so you can watch it. It's a bit odd for 20th first century standards, but visually very, very striking and powerful, particularly the opening sequence which shows Hitler flying into Nuremberg on a plane and it shows him descending from the clouds like an angel. It's very dramatic. I'm thinking of coming into school in the same way one day. On a similar vein, you look at the 1936 Olympics. Goebbels convinced Hitler that Germany should host the Olympics in Berlin. No other country in the world wanted it. It was offered to everybody, and because of the Great Depression and the cost of putting on the Olympics, everybody said, no, we can't do it. Goebbels saw it as a fabulous propaganda opportunity and a chance to prove Aryan superiority. Some countries, including the USA, threatened to boycott the games because of the Nazi racial policy. So Germany included one Jew in their team. I think he was a rower or a fencer, I can't remember, a fencer, to prove their equality. No expense was spared on the Olympics. They built a new 100,000-seater stadium and introduced many of the things which are now part of the Olympic tradition. The Olympic torch being carried through the country, uh, the Olympic athletes' village, specially built facilities for each sport, film and TV coverage, and a huge, lavish opening ceremony and closing ceremony. Many overseas visitors were suitably impressed by the spectacle, although some were suspicious that they weren't allowed much freedom. You couldn't wander around Germany and have a look for yourself. You were very carefully escorted to suitable places by the SS. Germany did finish top of the medal table by some distance, but the Nazis would probably have been disappointed that the real star of the Games was an American, uh, called Jesse Owens, a black American called Jesse Owens, who won four gold medals and broke 11 world records. That doesn't do a great deal for Aryan superiority. But the Olympics was a huge success and it did have a massive influence on people's opinions abroad. 
British, French, American politicians and journalists went to Germany and came back and, wow, there's some really, really impressive stuff happening there. Look also at radio and cinema. Goebbels was very quick to see the propaganda potential of the cinema. It was new, it was exciting and relatively cheap to visit. The Nazis produced hundreds of information films describing their achievements. Um, audiences tended to prefer holiday co Hollywood comedies. Some of the Nazi films were a bit dull. Go search them on YouTube. There's some bizarre examples there. They've got a, a weird comedy double act, sort of a Nazi version of Laurel and Hardy, who are painfully unfunny. But it's an interesting way of looking at what they're trying to do. More subtle is where they make films that aren't openly about the Nazi party. So you see them making detective films and horror films and adventure stories in which the hero is obviously a Nazi. Uh, he's tall and blonde and blue-eyed and good-looking and the villains often look suspiciously Jewish or have Russian, in other words, communist-sounding names. Radios were a popular form of mass entertainment and Goebbels was very quick to exploit them. He produced cheap radios to anyone who could afford them and controlled all the radio stations. Loudspeakers were placed in the streets and public buildings so people could hear the radio everywhere and many stations played continuous repeats of speeches by Hitler and other leading Nazis. Subconsciously, many people would have soaked up these messages without really noticing they were listening. Listening to foreign stations was illegal. Listening to the BBC was punishable by death, and some types of music were banned altogether, including jazz and blues, which Goebbels labelled black music. They also gave tangible physical rewards. So there's the gold cross. Women were encouraged to give up work and concentrate on being mothers. This fitted in with the Nazi idea of the perfect family, but also created jobs for men. The Nazis offered tempting financial incentives to persuade married couples to have more than four children. The gold cross was the highest award and was given to women who had eight kids. Presented personally by Hitler in lavish ceremonies, often at the Nuremberg rallies. So it's very high profile. It's putting people up on a pedestal. It's important because you can see it. It's visible, it's physical, it's real. Look at the public works programme. One of Hitler's key promises in 1932 was that he would end unemployment. The economist, Dr. Halmar Schacht, organised a massive job creation scheme where new roads, the autobahns, the bridges, harbours, hospitals, etc. were built. Unemployed men could join for six months, they could work for low wages on these schemes and rejoin for a second six months if they wanted. Gave them a job gave them regular income and skills. It was visible because these guys are out in the community working, so they're going to be wearing overalls and boiler suits with a swastika, brightly, clearly displayed on there. The things they make are going to have swastikas all over them. You'll stick a swastika on a bridge, you'll stick it on milestones down the side of the autobahns. As well as giving the men money, it gave them pride. It made them feel as if they were accomplishing something. The work was physically demanding and they had no real choice of where they were sent to work. Discipline was strict and you couldn't leave the scheme until the end of your six-month contract. But the things that are produced are visible. They're physical. They're impressive too. Hitler understood the importance of size. Make it big and people will admire it. There was also a four-year plan. A four-year plan was introduced in 1936 to prepare Germany for a possible war and was controlled by Hermann Goering. It introduced conscription to the army and created jobs, producing weapons, equipment and uniforms. Again, this boosted national pride in a country which had a culture of celebrating military achievement and success. Many Germans felt that they were finally emerging from the, the humiliation of defeat in the Great War and the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles. You've also got the Strength Through Joy scheme, which was aimed to increase the productivity of workers. Hard workers were rewarded with cheap theatre and cinema tickets. They could go on courses and trips and social events. They got cut-price tickets on holidays and cruise ships. 
real things that gave people something to aspire to, something to work towards. And everybody who went on one of these thanked the Nazis. But the People's Card, a Volkswagen Beetle. You paid five marks a week into a scheme to buy one of these cars, designed by Ferdinand Porsche. At a time when car ownership was a real symbol of financial success and prosperity. It does make you realise that you'll never want to watch Herbie on telly again when you know that actually that's a Porsche and was designed by the Nazi party. Oh well. You got the beauty of labour scheme aimed at workers as well, which improved working conditions in factories. It introduced things like low-cost canteens, washing facilities, real physical things you see every day, you use it every day, and you can see the Nazi name on it. You got the Reich Food Estate, which was set up in September 1933, and led by Richard Dare, set up central boards to buy agricultural produce from farmers and distribute it to markets across Germany gave peasant farmers a guaranteed market for their goods at guaranteed prices. The Reich entailed farm law, gave peasants state protection for their farms. Banks couldn't seize their land if they couldn't pay loans or mortgages. They made sure that peasants' farms stayed in their hands. And farming communities, the old Germany, was a key part of Hitler's support base. There was the Blood and Soil campaign, which emphasised that peasant farmers were a basis of Germany's master race and that their way of life must be protected. You've got Volksgemeinschaft, which literally means national community, which was this idea of all Germans thinking of themselves as part of a big national community, not to see themselves as individual workers or farmers, but as Germans with the first loyalty to Germany in the Fuhrer. Slightly ironic, because Volksgemeinschaft is actually quite a good description of communism, the one thing that Hitler's trying to destroy. There's a huge amount of effort put into youth, as we've seen before. The Hitler Youth, the League of German Maidens, set up to provide facilities and training for young people. Schools are one area that the Nazis took a huge amount of control in. Lessons and books were changed to support Nazi beliefs. History lessons changed so that Germany actually didn't lose the First World War. Science textbooks changed to prove that Aryans are genetically superior to all other species. These are things that are visible that you can f touch, you can pick it up, you can read it, you can see it, you can put your hand on it. And all of those things help to make people support the Nazis. Because they can see all the good. As you'll see in the second part of this, the negatives are less visible. Thank you very much for watching.